Okay, well, uh, greetings everyone, and uh, it's good to, to be uh, given the opportunity to give uh, a, a discourse on, on the harvest. Now this uh, discourse will follow on on what uh, the previous two discourses were, were about. So it's in one way, it's just going to lead to, uh, to the next step uh, after the, I guess, the cleansing of the sanctuary, as, uh, as was mentioned earlier on and uh, it's based on volume th uh, volume three and it's chapters five and six now there's quite a lot of information in those two chapters uh, and i'm going to try to uh, just pick out the, uh, the the key point now you're going to hear a lot of dates uh, throughout the talk and um if i'm going to start to explain the basis of those those dates i'll probably be taking uh, the rest of the day to, to conclude this discourse so for more information, I encourage you to read uh, volume two, which is entitled The Time is at Hand, to get an, an understanding of where these dates that I mentioned throughout the talk uh, are coming from and the basis for, uh, uh, for, for, for coming up with those, for those numbers. Okay, now, just to get a, in our mind the, the word harvest. Now, we, we hear that word mentioned many times throughout many discourses. But just, just to get in our mind, what, what is the, let's get a definition of the word harvest. Now, a harvest is a time of reaping. It's a time of gathering a crop that has ripened. That, that's what the harvest is. Now, that expression and this process is used in the Bible to depict the time and the work when the Lord returns to harvest church members at the end of the gospel age. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 39, there is the parable of the weeds. And in here it says, and the enemy that sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are angels. Now, the word angels, of course, uh, could signify invisible angels, but the word angel literally means messengers. So it, it could be a reference to both heavenly and, and earthly uh, messengers of, uh, uh, of, of the Lord who are reapers. So, but the point I want to make here is that the harvest is the end of the world. Okay? That's from that parable of the weeds, as, uh, as it's commonly known in, in Matthew chapter 13. Now, Bible chronology, according to Bible chronology, 1874 was established as the date when the, uh, the harvest is to start. This is the date that most Bible students believe is the, is the time of the Lord's return or his invisible parousia, as, as we understand it. And one of the first things that the Lord does is to gather his church members by resurrecting those who have died during the gospel age and then reaping or harvesting those who were alive at, at the time, at the time of his parousia. Now, according to biblical timing parallel, the harvest proper is a period of 40 years. However, when we take into account the subsequent gleaning testing, sifting, separation, and so forth, the completion of this process takes a longer period of time. So we're not to expect that the harvest will end in, in 1914, but there is, there's a lot more work that goes on after that to make the harvest complete. But the, the harvest proper, just to, keep with, to keep within the parallel, the harvest proper, or the, the bulk part of the harvest work is actually done within those 40 year period to keep the parallel uh, with the Jewish harvest. So now let's look at uh, let's look at Matthew chapter 13 and we'll read from verse 24 to verse 30 and then we will read from verse 36 to verse 43. Another parable said here before them saying, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, the enemy came and sowed tares also among the wheat and went away. 
But when the blade sprang up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. And the servant of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didn't thou not sow good seed in thy field? Whence then has it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy has done this. And the servant said unto him, Would thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest haply while you gather up the tares, you root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather up first the tares and bind them up in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. If we, if we go into verse 36 to 43, just to get the explanation of that. Then he left the multitude and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered and said, He that sows the good seed is the son of man, and the field is the world. And the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy that sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are angels. As therefore the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that cause stumbling, and them that do iniquity, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. Then, or, then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He that has ear, let him hear. Now, this is obviously talking about the whole gospel age, where we have a sowing uh, that started in the early days, in the, in the first century, started by Lord Jesus and, and, and his apostles. And then at the end of the world, we have a, a harvest. And in between, you know, the seeds grow and then an enemy comes and for some reason he managed to successfully plant a lot of weeds, which I understand to refer to imitation, uh, imitation wheat or imitation Christians. And, uh, and then, of course, we, and then the, the reapers were told, just, just, just don't pull them out. You might, damage, you might damage the good with the bad. So just, just leave, live as is. And then right at the end of the, at the, end of the world, we will, we will do the, the necessary work. Now, the sowing was started, as I said, by our Lord Jesus and completed by the apostles in the first century. Now, if you have a look at uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 23, if you can bring it up, brother. Uh, sorry, it's chapter 1, verse 23. We've made an error and you'll just have to read that one out. Okay, I will read it out. Uh, number verse 23, it says, If so, if so be that you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached in all creation under heaven, wherefore I, Paul, was made a minister. So that verse seems to suggest that the first century Christians have succeeded in, in planting all the seeds throughout the known world of the time. So the planting did occur by the end of, uh, of the first century. Now verse 40 of uh, Matthew chapter 13 identifies the harvest as coming at the time of the end, which, according to Bible chronology, we understand that to have started in the year 1799, which is the end of the 1260 years, which, which was mentioned uh, in previous talks, uh, which is the end of the 1260 years of power of the men of sin, the great oppressor of the true church. So when that power was taken away from, from, uh, from this oppressor in the year 1799, that was the beginning, according to volume three, that was the beginning of the time of the end. Now that's just the beginning of it. 
Now, from that time onward, many of the timelines mentioned in Daniel's prophecies started to be fulfilled, among which, as was mentioned in the previous talk, was Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, where it mentions the cleansing of the sanctuary, which was calculated to be in AD 46, and at which time a nucleus of God's holy people, the true church, the sanctuary, would become free of all errors of papacy, cleansed and ready to accept the principle of truth as, taught, as taught by, by our Lord, and their apostles, so that by the end of the 1335 days, which also I mentioned in the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 12, which you understand or we calculate to be 1874, these would be ready to be reaped by the sickle of present truth, as mentioned in Revelation, chapter 14, verse 15. And another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a voice to him that sat on the cloud, Send forth thy sickle and reap, for the hour to reap is come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now, how do we understand that? By present truth, we're not talking about just general Bible knowledge. There is a lot of Bible knowledge around. Bible knowledge is not meant there. Uh, many Christian sects have a lot of Bible knowledge, and some some. You know, some have a very, very good understanding of many, many concepts uh, of, of the scriptures. But we are talking about present truth. Present truth is, 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 a, is a little bit different than, than just general Bible study. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a growth into, it's a growth of Bible study. Whilst it includes general Bible study, Bible knowledge, it specifically refers to that part of biblical knowledge as pertaining to the arrival, the return, and mission of our Lord, his parousia, his invisible presence, which we understand occurred in the year, started to occur in the year 1874, and which is discerned by faithful, eye-seeing Christians. That's what we mean when we talk about present truth. It's to build up on existing truth. Present truth does not mean that the past truth was wrong. Present truth builds up on what was already truth in the past, and it just expands from it, advances on it, it builds on it. It doesn't go back and pull out something that was right then, which the Lord would have used to, uh, you know, for a purpose. And all of a sudden, say, "Oh no, that that was not that was wrong. Uh, we know better now." It, this this would obviously not be the case. Present truth has to be built built on biblical knowledge that was accepted. Of course, if there are errors. Uh, that, that we are is that we can quickly identify. Uh, well, Bible knowledge, present truth, may identify these errors and may clarify uh, a lot of concepts that are uh, that, uh, that that are within the Bible that may have been un misunderstood by by many. So, a thorough, sincere, honest-hearted, and spirit-driven study of the Scriptures and of the divine plan will show these dates and statements to be true. And correct. So now carrying on the parallel between the end of the Jewish age and the end of the gospel age further, they show that after 40 years after our Lord's return, his first and his second, a time of trouble would set in and the harvest proper would end. After the harvest proper ended, there was a work of gleaning and sifting to do which continued on for a while longer. And not until all these works are completed can we say that the harvest has entirely ended and the door to the heavenly calling has closed. Be it noted, however, that the harvest work starting in 1874 is only one of the many features of the Lord's return. And God willing, we can discuss these other features another time. So before moving on to the next part, I want to emphasize that the harvest is preceded by a time of preparation of 75 years, as mentioned in Daniel chapter 12, verse 7, 11, and 12, starting at the end of the 1260 days in 1799 and ending in 1874 at the end of the 1335 days. These are very important dates that need to be kept in mind if we are to understand uh, 
where we stand, we should have to understand the plan of God and where we stand in the stream of time. I'm not going to read those scriptures, but these are there just for, uh, for reference. All right, so we talked about the timing of the harvest when it starts. So what is involved in the work of the harvest? Well, as mentioned, harvest is a time of reaping. It is not a time of sowing. Those that are harvested were already wheat-like wheat at that time. They were not converted from weeds. So there's a big difference between planting and harvesting. The apostles in the early days, they were planting. The world did not know about a lot of, did not know about, about, about the God, the God of Israel or anything like that, particularly with the Gentile world, very little, and even among the Jewish people. So there had to be a planting back then, which we know was accomplished by the end of the first century. In John chapter 4, verse 35 to 38. I'd like to read that. It says, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look onto the fields, that they are white already under harvest. He that reaps receives wages, and gathers fruit unto life eternal. And he that sows, and he that reaps may rejoice together. For herein is the truth, is the saying true. One sows, and another reaps. I sent you to reap that where are, whereon you have not labored, others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. So when we look at the first century, we can get some idea of how the, how the harvest work. Under the supervision of the Lord and his announcement of the kingdom at hand, his true followers in the first century were sent forth to carry out that message throughout Israel. They reaped what was planted by others. They reaped what was planted by the patriarchs, the prophets, the holy men of old. And those who were Israelites indeed accepted the message and became believers. In the case of Israel, there was a, a dual work. It was a harvest of a Jewish age, which was followed by a planting into the gospel age. Anyone harvested out of the Jewish age was planted into the gospel age by means of new doctrines, which became the seeds of the new dispensation. Now, the harvest of the gospel age follows a similar pattern. The field is predominantly the Christian world, or Christendom as we call it, where the seeds have grown. That's the field. As mentioned in Matthew chapter 13, verse 28 to 30, during the gospel age, there was no attempt to separate the wheat, the true Christians, from the weed, the imitation Christians. At harvest time, however, when the crop is ripe, under the instruction of the master, the weeds are separated out and bundled up for burning, as mentioned in Matthew chapter 13, verse 40 to 42. Why the weeds are separated out when it looks like it should be the other way around? Well, because in reality, the weeds are the intruders. But because there's so much of it, it looks like it should be the other way around. But from the master's perspective, he removes the weeds out of his field. He did not plant weeds. He planted wheat, and the wheat got in the way. So yes, they are the soda. There may be a lot more weeds than there are wheat. But nevertheless, from the master's perspective, he had the work. The workers or the reapers had to pull out all these weeds that have gotten into way, into the way. Now the other way around is also mentioned in another scripture in Revelation chapter eighteen, verse four, when talking of getting out of Babylon the great, the great which is the head of the so-called Christian world. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come forth, my, friend, my, my people, out of her, 
that you have no fellowship with her and that you receive not of her plagues. Just excuse me. In the harvest, a true Christian's role is not to convert the world, but to witness to it, to let his light shine so as to seek out and identify those who are already consecrated to the Lord at heart, and by means of present truth knowledge, the Lord will then seal them in the forehead, as mentioned in Revelation chapter 17, verse 3. saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the tree, till we shall have sealed the servants of our God on their forehead. Once individuals are out of sectarian Babylon, they learn to walk with the Lord by belonging to him only, outside any human organization. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. For freedom did Christ set us free, Stand fast, therefore, and be not entangled again in a yoke of bondage. So they don't go to or form another organization or sect or come out of one Babylon only to enter into another, from one daughter into another. The identification of Babylon or any of her daughters is not only in their teachings, works, legalism, etc., but more importantly, in their spirit. They may look like Christians, act like Christians, conduct Bible studies like Christians, but they manifest a different spirit in their lives and culture. A spirit of the world, a spirit out of harmony with the spirit of the truth. That's what we need to look at. The spirit that is manifested by these organizations, not, not on the outside, but on the inside, in their culture. Because a lot of them, and I can speak from experience, a lot of them look wonderful from the outside until you get into it and then you realize that it's a completely different spirit that's driving this organization in the name of God and in the name of Jesus. Now that's to clarify one thing. When it is said that all of Babylon, great and small, and their daughters will be completely removed and destroyed, we are talking of organizations. We are not talking of individuals. In a case of individuals, their imitation Christian characters will eventually be destroyed, but not their lives. Now, coming out of Babylon or being separated in the harvest is only a first step. A testing, a sifting, and a replacement process follows after that. We have the example of uh, Judas and Peter in the Bible, those closest to the Lord. Judas was tested and failed. Peter was tested and nearly failed. Admittedly, this occurred before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, but it shows what can happen after one is selected by the Lord or comes out of Babylon. There are many warnings in the Bible, and specifically in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, about holding tight to our salvation, remaining, remaining wise and not giving up and enduring until the end. Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. If we can bring this up. It said, They shall war against the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they also shall overcome that are with him, called and chosen and faithful. So that verse shows that being called or accepting the invitation of the call is not the be all and end all. It needs to be accepted. We need to be accepted. And then even after that, we need to be faithful unto death. So we need to keep those three words in mind, Call, called, chosen, and faithful. Many are called, few are chosen. We've heard that expression in other parts of the Bible. So there is a testing. Just because someone has been harvested out does not guarantee that they're saved. It's still a process that needs to be followed. It's a testing uh, and one can lose it and then you yeah, have to be replaced by somebody else. 
This testing is indicated in a, in a parable of Matthew chapter 22, verse 1 to 14. Now, this is a long one. Uh, I'm not going to read it, but essentially it's talking about uh, it's the parable of the wedding feast where many are invited to, uh, to a wedding. But then we found out is that when the king comes, he finds out that one guest was not wearing his robe, was not wearing his white robe. Now, we understand the robe, of course, to mean to mean, you know, the acceptance of, of the ransom, the blood of Christ. This, of course, symbolizes a class of people who not only their robe was spotted, but they actually were not even wearing it. Therefore, it's a denial, a denial of the ransom. That we can, we can interpret as symbolizing a class of people, what we call the second death class of people. Christians who at some time other they would not have been invited in the uh, in the wedding. They, they were in the wedding for some reason. They must have had that, that robe on them, but for some reason they must have removed it. Seems to be a reference to a, to a denial of the ransom, and pointing to a class of people who were called, maybe chosen, but unfortunately they did not remain faithful. They rejected it all, and so they were rejected. Uh, okay, uh, so that's one class. We can see one class, the second class, uh, second death class, as we call it. Another class is mentioned in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 to 17, by the way. And I saw these things, and behold, a great multitude which no man could number, and out of every nation, and of all tribes and people, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, arrayed in white robes and palms in their hands, and they cried with a voice, saying, Salvation unto God, who sits in the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around about the throne, and about the elders, and the four living creatures, and they fell before the throne on their face, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing, glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answers, saying to me, these that are arrayed in white robes, who are they? And when they come, they. And I say unto them, unto him, my Lord, thou knowest. And he said to me, these are they that come out of great tribulation. And they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And, uh, and he that sits on the throne shall spread his tabernacle over them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun strike upon them, nor any heat. For the lamb that is in the midst of the throne shall be their shepherd, and he shall guide them unto fountains of waters of life, and God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. So now here's another class of people that is mentioned, those who had to wash their robes to make them white. And these were identified as being the great multitude, which uh, is a very large number of many who were called, who, uh, who were chosen, and ultimately they remained faithful, but, but before that they obviously must have gone to some problems uh, some worldly issues, maybe it could be a number of different issues that may have spotted their uh, their, their robes, and therefore they were not numbered among the uh, uh, the, the 144,000. So we see then that uh, these two classes, the, the second death class and and the, the great multitude class, they were sifted out and needed to be replaced by others so as to maintain the fixed number of the little flock. Another parable that illustrates this last-minute replacement is in, uh, is in Matthew chapter 20, verse 1 to 16. And this, this, uh, this parable shows that at the 11th hour, past the time for the calling, still some were standing saying, we haven't been called. And yet the Lord hires them. He calls them. It appears that these also are invited 
at the last phase of the harvest before the door to the heavenly call is completely shut. For the kingdom of the heaven is like a man that was a householder, as householder, who went out in early morning to hire laborers in the vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a shilling a day, he sent them into the vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing in the marketplace idle. And to them he said, go ye also into the vineyard and whatsoever is right, I will give you. And they went their way again. He went out about the sixth hour and the ninth yeah. hour and did likewise. Yeah. And about it's just the level. Oh. Yeah. Uh, brother, could you please uh, mute your microphones? Uh, at about the eleventh hour, he went out and found found others standing, and he said unto them, "Why send you here all day idle?" They say to him, because no man has hired us. He said unto them, go ye also into the vineyard. And when he was come, the Lord of the vineyard said unto his steward, call all the laborers and pay them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came to the hire about the eleventh hour, they received every man a shilling. And when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more, and they likewise received every man a shilling. And when they received it, they murmured against the householder, saying, These have spent but one hour and has made them equal unto us, who have borne the burden of the day and of the scorching heat. But he said, but he answered and said to the one to one of them, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Did not thou agree with me for a shilling? Take up what is thine. And go thy way. It is if it is my will, it is my will to give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with my own? Or is thy own evil because I am good? So shall the last be first and the first last. So it just shows that even after the calling maybe has stopped, there was still many that are yet to come in because many were falling out many were not remaining faithful unto the end or, or, or and consequently they needed to be replaced now that is why the harvest proper while it may be a period of 40 years it continues on for a, 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 a longer period of time so that ultimately once everyone has been tested to the end we can then say that the harvest will end or the door will be completely shut. So we, what we discussed so far is the timing of the harvest. We discussed the work of the harvest. Well, let's now look at one other subject, one other question that we may, we're going to try and answer if we can. When does the harvest completely end and when does the door shut? Matthew chapter 25, verse 10. And while they went away to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Of course, when that happens, that's it. They... Uh, Opportunity of entering into, into the marriage feast is, is over. Now the door or the gate that is also referred to in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14 must close at some stage and the harvest must conclude. So how can we tell? Is it possible to tell when it will end? Well, John chapter 9, verse 4. We must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. So now we're starting to get a bit of an, an indication from the scriptures what, what to look for to say, well, look, the door has really shut, as it says, when the night comes and when no man can work. 
Now we understand, of course, the night to refer to the, to the tribulations coming on the world where it is impossible to work. Hence, the harvest would finish then. Another scripture is, is to, to note too is Amos chapter 9, verse 13. Behold, the days come, says Jehovah, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the traders of grapes him that sowed seed, and the mountain shall drop sweet wine, and the hills shall melt. So that scripture shows that the plowman or the time of trouble will come after the harvest is completed and prepare the world or the field for a planting of new seeds. And we understand that to be a reference to the seeds are for the earthly kingdom phase. So these are a couple of scriptures that give us an indication to show that at some stage that harvest will be completely finished. But when? Well, we don't want to be dogmatic and sort of start pointing to dates, and I know many have tried to do so, but there are a number of ways where one can know when the harvest and all the subsequent features will be completely finished. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read uh, through three of them. And by, and by the way, that information is all taken from, uh, from, as I mentioned before, from chapters five and six. Of, uh, of volume three. So one way of knowing when the harvest and its subsequent features will be completely finished is by a definite Bible statement of the exact date. Whilst there are definite Bible statements regarding the end of the harvest, the exact date is not directly mentioned. Many Bible student groups whilst agreeing with the starting date of the harvest, have calculated various dates over the years for its closing. And I'll mention some. 1914, 1916, 1918, 1925, 1933, 1954, 1975. And more recently, we, we heard uh, 2033 and 2043. Etc. And I know there are other dates as well uh, that were put out by others. I may have uh, obviously, uh, not mentioned them all. Now, everyone, of course, have some scriptural backing for coming up with a date. And I'm sure that others have many dates as well of their own. I know I have dates of mine, and you may think I'm crazy if I started to tell you what they are. But time will tell if any of these dates are correct. One thing is for sure. When the night comes, that is when the troubles start, we should be looking for the closure of that door soon after. So that's one way. Another way is a reversal of public sentiments with regard to the truth, where it will no longer meet with opposition and persecution as it did throughout the gospel age. Well, the world today, particularly the so-called Christian world, where the seeds have grown, does not seem to care anymore about religious matters, and everyone is given the liberty to worship as they please without interference. Now that's within the Christian world, all right? And certainly we see that happening in the Christian world. Yes, there is a lot of persecutions around in the world, but when we analyze these persecutions, we found that a lot of them are for religious slash political reasons by fanatics who want to either convert everybody to their own way or they want to control the world, driven mainly by politics, power, ethnic or racial reason by narrow-minded people. Certainly a lot of persecution for, for those things today. Uh, there's persecution for interfering with the rights of others or for being an annoyance to others, such as calling at their doors early morning or at dinner time with a, with a message from the Bible. That's being persecuted for interfering with the rights of others, certainly not being persecuted for righteousness' sake. I remember when I was a Jehovah's Witness, I used to think when somebody would uh, reject us for the message, we used to go, go out and thinking, oh, we, we, we would rejoice because we've been persecuted. When I look back, I realize, well, yeah, we were persecuted for being a nuisance, not for, uh, for righteousness sake. We could have been preaching Buddhism or Islam to them. We would still have, have the same response. There's also a thing called a self-persecution, 
which is a case where one is being persecuted by his or her own imagination, automatically interpreting the, uh, the adverse actions on the part of others as persecution. Very rarely are such persecution for true religious reasons as it was in the gospel age. Sadly, some religious persecution today comes from those closest to us, our family members, or even our, our own brothers and sisters in the faith who misunderstand us. And let's not confuse the trouble that one cares, gets from the imperfections of the flesh with persecution for righteousness' sake. This trouble is common to all mankind, regardless of their beliefs. Finally, another way of knowing uh, when the door has closed is where the opportunity for service will completely be obstructed. Now, there's a lot more that can be said on this sometimes touchy subject, and I certainly encourage all not just to read through studies, studies 5 and 6 of Volume 3, but to actually study it properly and thoroughly so that we can see eye to eye, as mentioned in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 8. The voice of the watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together do they sing, for they shall see eye to eye when Jehovah returns to Zion. Then we'll be ready to enter into the final phase of the Lord's presence before the ushering in of the kingdom. So in conclusion, regardless of what we may think on the subject of the timing, work, and end of the harvest, let us remember the words of the Apostle Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Wherefore, brethren, give the more diligence, diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never stumble. Thank you.